Listener's note. Throughout this book, there appear tables, formulas, and other such items that do not lend themselves to audiobook format. These can be found to download at www.tommyrodriguez.me The Tree with Many Branches A collection of essays in computational phylogenetics Written by Tommy Rodriguez Narrated by Alex Botton To Ethan and Roxanne My love, my life, my joy Forward In 2003, scientists at the Human Genome Project sequenced the entire 23 chromosome pairs of the human genome for the very first time. This achievement is hailed by many as one of the greatest scientific triumphs in human history. It set the stage stage for a host of fields, disciplines and applications in bioscience that would later provide more insight about the way we look at ourselves and at the vast diversity of living organisms around us. Since then, tens of thousands of species have been sequenced in some fashion, most of which are bacteria. Although the exact number is unknown, publicly accessible genomic databases, such as GenBank and Gold, now house roughly an estimated 100 million plus records of complete DNA sequences, gene sets, RNA or protein sequences. The field of bioinformatics was born out of the need to manage, analyse and examine raw genomic data in meaningful ways. Computer technology and life science now had a place where they could both reside together. The inner biology have always fascinated me. Early on, reading the works of Charles Darwin, Francis Crick, Richard Dawkins and others influenced me to pursue the biosciences at the highest level of academia. Like many undergraduate students, I flip-flopped college majors on a few occasions, but mostly stayed within the confines of life science and other computer-related fields. At the time, academic programs in computational biology were scarce. Consolidating my diverse backgrounds was not a feasible option at the universities that I attended. Only later, during my late 20s, was I able to merge both disciplines at the University of Maryland University College, where I earned a graduate degree in biotechnology. My general specialisation was, and still is, bioinformatics, or the application of computer technology to biological data. And it was during this time in, gra- and it was during this time in graduate school that I also took a particular interest in computational phylogenetics, a field of research that generally falls within the umbrella of bioinformatics. I then spent much of my graduate career writing algorithms for distance matrix models and computer code for genomic analysis tools. As we will see later, many of the same computational biology programs that I adopted in graduate school were also utilised towards my later works. One at a time, I filled the years that followed graduation engaged in several different research projects of my own. Essentially, this book is a compilation of those studies. I found it somewhat liberating in having the flexibility of independent research. Of course, the downside to working independently also lies in the limitations of self-funding and the lack of scholarly collaborations. Still, Independent research has given me the opportunity to access to explore a wide array of inquiries and topics in phylogenetics that may not be present otherwise. Opting not to work or intern for a private firm where research might be dictated by senior staff members. Today, I submit and publish my work through various internationally well-known peer-reviewed open access journals. More recently, I have expanded my studies to include ecological restoration for a path towards conservation genetics. To start, I would not presume to describe my research as novel or breakthrough or even cutting edge. However, it is in the application of computational techniques, experiment design and probabilistic models where my research finds a stronghold. As a matter of practicality, the original manuscripts have been edited for a broader audience due to its highly technical language. The essays compiled in these pages have undergone a facelift from their original scientific format format 
into a more reader-friendly layout as to better accommodate two different perspectives, both experts and non-experts alike. I thought it best to begin the book by outlining my standard practices, procedures, methods and techniques for building phylogenies as means to educate the reader on how I later reach inferences or conclusions. While this book is a recollection of essays in computational phylogenetics, the central theme deals directly with the inferences brought forth in conjunction with the evolutionary relatedness of organisms and groups of organisms in phylogenetic context. Topics range from the evolutionary implications of biological aging to cancer-associated trends in primate populations. Others include the influences of radiation-induced evolution to the origins of domesticated dog breeds. The first case science, chapter 3, involves my work investigating the evolutionary development of aminoglycide resistant genes in pathogenic bacteria, which was also featured in another book entitled Top 10 Contributions in Bioinformatics and Systems Biology, Volume 2018, published by Avid Science. One essay also includes a fully comprehensive sampling of a near-complete mammalian phylogeny based on complete mitochondrial biomarkers. This book also contains a bonus chapter. Some may even consider it controversial. As the latter years of graduate school were winding down, I spent some time preparing myself to become a life science educator, and evolution denial is a topic that repeatedly resurfaced in my curriculum. The thought may seem silly to future generations as they read this entry, but in this modern time, there is still much controversy surrounding the topic of biological mutable ebony sectors across America. As a researcher and life science educator, I find it hard to remain silent in the face of opposition to a scientific fact. The final chapter is a more simplified version of an essay written 10 years ago that discusses this topic in detail. Embodying wide areas of undisputable evidence, it lays out a compelling case against opposing viewpoints, with the purpose of correcting any misconceptions about the theory of biological Chapter 1. Who Wants to Build a Tree? When Charles Darwin was on board the HMS Beagle in 1837, he had a game-changing suspicion about living systems. Species were not immutable, he thought. Instead, they, populations of organisms, descend and diversify from linear predecessors. He wrote down some of his first ideas, involving common ancestry, on what we now know as the Darwin Notebooks from the Voyage of the Beagle. In his notes, he depicted the famous I Think sketch, where he attempts to illustrate patterns of diversification from nested lineages in the form of connected and dispersing branches. Without knowing the importance that it would later signify, Charles Darwin unwittingly sketched the first phylogenetic tree. Darwin's tree did not have a root, nor did it represent any specific thing or any specific set of actual lineages or groups of organisms that we know of. His tree was abstract and totally conceptual in nature. Today, most phylogenetic trees are illustrated as cladograms, or rooted trees containing nested hierarchies of relatedness between living organisms. During his time, Darwin had no prior knowledge of the mechanisms or even the existence of a cell. Less much so did he know about genetics, which only came about at the turn of the 20th century with the discovery of DNA by James Watson and Francis Crick. Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection explains the process in which certain hereditable traits and variations help organisms survive and reproduce to become more common in a population over time. But it does not explain the mechanisms by which those variations occur and are later inherited by the we examine. Generally speaking, a phylogenetic tree can be defined as a diagram showing a series of evolutionary pathways from a common ancestor to different descendants and it describes these evolutionary pathways via divergent events that split series of nodes into corresponding taxa. There are essentially two lines of data that we examine when building phylogenies, morphology and genetics. For purposes of the material covered in this book, we will look at the latter. 
To greater or lesser extents, all organisms share molecular variation patterns due entirely to their common ancestry to one another. Through molecular sequencing, different degrees of relatedness can be measured and determined with high scopes of confidence. In phylogeny research, two types of trees are commonly used in practice, rooted and unrooted trees. A rooted tree is a tree in which one of the nodes is related to be the root, and the direction of ancestral relationship is determined in a nested hierarchy of outgroup and ingroup lineages. As you move from the root to the tips, or taxa, you are moving forward in time. The nodes located on a rooted tree are considered a point of speciation, or the event where populations diverge into new distinct species. Unrooted trees can also be useful in showing general relatedness between and among organisms, but do not necessarily imply an ancestral root. Edge lengths, also known as branches, are important features of phylogenetic trees, as they can be interpreted as rough time estimates. Building a phylogenetic tree from genomic data requires the application of several different computational techniques, which are covered in the following sections. In any such case, the very first step in any tree building exercise starts with a well thought out experimental design. This is when we think about the topic that we are interested in investigating and essentially how it will be executed. Next, the researcher must decide on sequence selection, followed by data collection and sequence analysis. Lastly, the algorithms one chooses towards sequence alignment and distance matrix modeling is a final critical step for reconstructing a phylogeny, where utilizing the right combination of methods can result in better resolution and overall accuracy. Genomic databases. With these general principles guiding us forward, we are ready to build a phylogenetic tree. So let us get to it then. If we were researchers building a phylogenetic tree as part of an experiment, we would start by compiling a genomic data set of organisms to arrange into a tree. Suppose you are interested in finding the degree of relatedness between a group of pathogenic bacteria. bacteria. Perhaps your focus is aimed at identifying the evolutionary pathways among old world monkeys that led to modern humans. Whether you want to explore one biological inquiry or another, from the very small to the moderately large, much of the data that you will need to conduct an experiment is at your fingertips, literally and figuratively speaking. Today, most genomic data can be accessed and collected via publicly accessible databases. As noted earlier, two lines of data can be used to build a phylogenetic tree. However, we can expect to get much higher resolution utilizing genome scale data to infer phylogenies, rather than just physical traits alone, although combining both may be the best practice if the corresponding data is available. This is mainly due to the amount of information we can get from sequence comparisons. When comparing genomic sequences, there is a general rule of thumb. Sequences, a larger number of differences corresponds to less related species, whereas a smaller number of differences corresponds to a more closely related type. Furthermore, selecting the right sequence data set is an important factor in the experiment design stage, as it can have consequences on the overall accuracy of a sequence alignment. Sequences themselves are available in many different formats, sizes, and types. Methods, procedures, and algorithmic selection. In molecular phylogenetists seeking advice on their experimental design are mainly confronted with what can go wrong when using a certain method and what are the most important factors influencing accuracy. From the perspectives of methodology, I often utilize a preferred combination of statistical algorithms due to their continued reliability. One, K-Align for multiple sequence alignments, MSA. Two, pairwise comparison. And three, PHYLIP, Philip, neighbor joining matrix method. An accurate and fast MSA algorithm K-Align is a dependable algorithmic selection for purposes of obtaining highly robust alignments. K-Align is an extension of Wu Manba approximate pattern matching algorithm based on Levenstein distances. 
This strategy enables K-Align to estimate sequence distance faster and more accurately than other popular iterative methods. K-Align has been shown to be about 10 times faster than Clustal W and, depending on the alignment size, up to 50 times faster than other iterative methods. It also delivers better overall resolution. Philip neighbor joining matrix modeling can generate high probable diagrams amid scenarios involving low degrees of variance, regardless of alignment size. Appropriated towards tree building exercises, Philip neighbor joining is an accurate and statically consistent polynomial time algorithm that does not assume that all lineages evolve at the same rate, and it constructs a tree by successive clusterings of lineages, setting branch lengths as the lineages join, where a set of n taxa requires n minus three iterations. Each step is repeated by bracket n minus one bracket times it times n minus one bracket. This method incorporates a set of default parameters for distance matrix model F84, Additional bootstrapping compilers are often set to 70% to 75%, while translation ratios are generated automatically under default settings. For preference purposes, the following formula demonstrates a standard neighbor joining Q matrix algorithm. For the full formula, please see the website. Summary. With proper training and stark curiosity, the application of computational phylogenetics can lead us to a better understanding of the complexities involved in the diversity and distribution of living organisms over the span of evolutionary time. Phylogenetic trees provide a glimpse into these evolutionary pathways. However, let us not forget that phylogenies themselves are often regarded as inferences to a hypothesis about an evolutionary inquiry. This makes biological perspectives even more, imp more important to the tree building process. The higher our degree of confidence in the accuracy of a cladogram, the more reliable our inferences are about the results. In the next chapter, we start with a simple comparison. To begin our journey into the world of computational phylogenetics, I utilize a common genome type to determine the accuracy among various sets of computational algorithms commonly used in phylogenetics. The speed and accuracy of three popular algorithms will be benchmarked, as they can help us better decide on the most reliable Chapter 2 Technological Perspectives in Computational Phylogenetics Originally published in the Journal of Advances in Bioscience and Biotechnology Biological information is compiled of huge amounts of raw data. Collecting, processing and managing that biological data can be a challenge. Since the turn of the century, modern technology has allowed advanced next-generation sequencing to be achieved with ever-increasing precision. As of 2020, studies in computational phylogenetics largely involve genomic datasets that are manageable through a network of simplified computer systems. Supercomputers are generally not required in most cases, even amongst the most extraneous scenarios. Nonetheless, in consideration of computing for bioinformatics, the following computational factors should always be considered prior to experiment design to experiment design, regardless of the logistics behind sequence data. 1. Operating system 2. Processor 3. Physical memory 4. Disk storage 5. Algorithm selection 6. Bioinformatics platform 7. Related software and 8. Network peripherals Other biometric hardware components may be required. Early in my academic career, I sought experiments such as these to compare the accuracy and execution times of various popular Bayesian algorithms for multiple sequence alignment. The results of the experiment, later described in this chapter, would lean in the direction of one particularly fast and efficient MSA model. This study included complete sequences of mtDNA that had been collected from the NCBI nucleotide database and imported into a bioinformatics software called UGENE. Eugene. A series of multiple sequence alignment tasks were performed on 13 mtDNA sequences of mammalian origin. Each sequence represents a species within a unique taxonomical group. As a first option, I selected K-line for multiple sequence alignment. 
several studies have shown significantly large discrepancies in execution times, accuracy and resolution when K-line is compared against other computational Bayesian algorithms. In this respective test trial, K-line for MSA yielded regular timeframes of T greater than 136.15 seconds and T is less than 139.95 seconds on five separate instances. Far superior than MUSCLE, muscle, which required exceedingly longer time frames per interval. MAFFT is another speedy alternative for MSA. As illustrated, FFT generated remarkable execution times that are comparable, if not better, to the time frames produced by K line. Yet, in cases involving large scale genomic data sets with increased evolutionary distances, K line provides better overall resolution. As Lassman and Sonhammer, the creators of K-Line, point out, the quality of methods in test sets, namely Clustal W, Muscle, and MAFFT, decreased in their own test trials when the number of input sequences was increased. This too became evident as I increased the number of taxonomical groups in my working base pair alignments. Here, Muscle and MAFFT generated a handful of cladogram irregularities that were inconsistent with earlier results, containing a reduced volume of sequences. Before proceeding, I should briefly note the original FASTA FASTA data files did not exceed 220 kilobytes. FASTA format is often used in computational phylogenetics. Lightweight datasets are critical also, among other variables that help reduce potential bottlenecks. Using our genomic data sets to examine computational performance, I was able to quantify the amount of useful workload compared against time and resources. Here again, my results would favor K-line for multiple sequence alignment. Taken as a whole, K-line requires minimal amounts of resources for execution in the shortest amount of time. In my test trials, I repeated this procedure for multiple intervals until an average mark was obtained. During runtime, CPU frequency levels peaked at 28.8% and hovered between 26 and 28%. At first, the physical memory usage averaged between 25 and, 20 and 26 megabytes and steadily fluctuated during MSA runtime, but did not exceed 26.9 megabytes. Only 1.2 megabytes of additional RAM was required to perform MSA on any given instance. In comparison, both muscle and MAFFT far exceeded a computational efficient mark for physical memory usage, as reflected in figure two. Figure three also highlights the average range of CPU frequency between these algorithms, where muscle and MAFFT exceeded the average mark set by Kalin. Insert, however, we're gonna do the, uh, the figures here. Utilizing complete mitochondrial genomes in computational phylogenetics. For several reasons that are well known in the field of molecular phylogenetics, mtDNA is a suitable choice for examining divergent events among clients. In sequence, rapid evolution rates in mtDNA create more molecular variants among immediate populations. This has notable advantages when studying ancestral relationships whose divergence times are thought to be no greater than 8 to 10 MYR. Moreover, mtDNA is easier to isolate, purify and sequence than entire sequences of nuclear DNA, nDNA. Each sample cell can contain a thousand copies of mtDNA and only a single copy of nDNA. Another advantage is that mtDNA degrades slower than nDNA and it contains a higher prevalence of fossilized remains, which allow genetic comparisons of extinct species and closely related non-extinct species. With a few rare exceptions, mitochondria is inherited solely through the maternal line and it has an important role in phylogeny research. Admittedly, mtDNA alignments are not built phylogenetics for all facets of molecular phylogenetics, especially when comparing molecular variation patterns amongst organisms that span large evolutionary scales. Such scenarios may produce irregular results. Consequently, a set of issues arise from using matrilineal lineages to build phylogenetic trees. One. Rapid rates in base pair substitution create saturation that can result in homoplasy. 
Two, should male and female history differ in a species, then this marker would not reflect the history of the species as a whole, but that of the female portion. Three, hybridization can cause mtDNA to move freely between species and may infer incorrect relationships when building phylogenies. Incorrect conclusions on several peer-reviewed studies have raised contention about using mtDNA alone in phylogeny research, including a recent paper, The Majority of Phylogenies of Polar Bears and Brown Bears, which resulted in incorrect evolutionary inferences due to hybridization. Of course, examples of natural hybridization leading to speciation are exceedingly rare, especially in mammals. While most known cases of hybrid speciation occur in plants, the majority of documented instances involving eukaryotes have been observed in fish and insects. As it relates to phylogenetic experiments described in this chapter, other studies also examining the evolutionary lineages of mammalians, particularly Elephantidae and Serenia, have confirmed those relationships via genetics, where some of the most direct support comes in the form of mtDNA. In fact, the results of my own mitochondria-based cladogram support many of the inferences raised by others. To start, the phylogenetic tree in figure 4 illustrates a parent clade containing a divergent narrative of divergent events that are consistent with the historical record of the family Elephantidae. Note the clade containing Elephas and Mammuthus, sister taxa to Loxodonata, extend outwards towards Mammut American. It then follows that molecular analysis combined with comparative morphology put manatees and dugongs amongst the closest living relatives to modern elephants. Again, these evolutionary relationships are further depicted in figure 4, which can be found on the website. I expand group taxonomy further as to include Hippopotamidae, Rhinocerotidae and Orictoopodidae. It was the Goodman 1981 study which first identified a set of unique molecular similarities in amino acid sequences of A crystalline A. Among the Ardvar, Orictoopodidae, Ophir, Penungulates, Manatee, Hyrax, and Elephant. And these evolutionary relationships have since been detailed by other well known sources, namely Honeycutt in 2008 and Nishihara in 2005. Orictoropodidae shares a fairly high degree of genetic similarity with three distinct groups. One, Elephantidae, two, Serenia, and three, Rhinocerotidae, whereas Hippopotamida are more closely related to modern cetaceans and contain the least degree of genetic similarity amongst the six groups in this experiment. Morphological data coupled together with fossil evidence has also shown patterns of close relatedness between the four of the six clades. Once again, the full extent of these evolutionary relationships matches the lineal record illustrated in figure 4. Summary. Although a handful of inaccurate conclusions have raised questions about its reliability, many researchers, including myself, would still agree that mitochondrial genomes can provide sufficient resolution for reconstructing a robust phylogeny and facilitate the molecular because divergence events within a phylogeny, even among time-extended lineages. Some experts will argue that mtDNA sequences are only useful for species level and genus level analysis, yet the boundary that separates populations based on those genomic markers are still not well defined and it should be explored further. Because computational performance is tied to instances that have potential bearings on the outcome of phylogenetic experiment, I argue in favour of a practical and simplified approach to phylogeny research. Lightweight genomic datasets, such as mtDNA sequences, combined with efficient Bayesian algorithms for computational phylogenetics, can help reduce potential bottlenecks, make up for lacklustre hardware, and narrow the scope of error. Although this framework is not new to the field of computational phylogenetics, this chapter reinforces its reliability in both performance and accuracy. And accuracy. Chapter 3 Phylogenetic Considerations in the Evolutionary Development of Aminoglycoside Resistant Genes in Pathogenic Bacteria. Originally published in the Journal of Phylogenetics and Evolutionary Biology. Antibiotic resistance in pathogenic bacteria has been the source of concern in recent times. Each year, 
In the United States, at least 2 million people become infected with bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, and at least 23,000 people die each year as a direct result of these infections. Repeated usage of antibiotic drugs can cause resistance to become more prevalent. Susceptible bacteria are killed or inhibited by an antibiotic, resulting in a selective pressure for the survival of resistant strains. Moreover, resistance is rapidly expanding to include several critical and used to treat the most invasive infections. Today, New findings suggest that antibiotic resistance appeared long before the introduction of antibiotic drugs. Over 300 sets of homologous protein coding genes for antimicrobial resistance have been identified amongst the five bacteria types. Interestingly, some of the highest degrees of genetic similarity in antimicrobial resistance genes are shared between bacterial pathogens and modern soil-dwelling varieties. Nitrogen-fixing bacteria are thought to have developed resistance from selective pressure in soil, which acts as a reservoir for antimicrobial resistance. Such a scenario presumes that pathogenic bacteria may have acquired resistance through evolutionary events, with a common ancestor of a soil-dwelling bacterium. This chapter revisits antibiotic resistance as a source of evolutionary development in pathogenic bacteria. Taking a molecular phylogenetic approach to this inquiry, I seek to find homologous correlations in antimicrobial resistant gene families across a broad spectrum of bacteria, as to identify the possible acquisition of these genes through divergent events in evolutionary context. The scope of my investigation will again feature techniques in computational phylogenetics for reconstructing a phylogeny based on two distinct sets of multiple sequence alignments involving antimicrobial resistance gene families. The ARDB Antibiotic Resistance Genes Database lists approximately 373 protein coding genes for antimicrobial resistance. A significant percentage of those genes are associated with pathogenic bacteria. This chapter concerns itself with one group of one variety, aminoglycoside-resistant genes. Aminoglycoside-resistant genes and of the side-resistant genes are widely spread in bacteria genera, and they play an important role in antibiotic drug resistance. These genes are characterized by three primary mechanisms of resistance, namely ribosome alteration, decreased permeability, and inactivation of the antibiotics by modifying enzymes. Antimicrobial resistance spreads as bacteria themselves move from place to place. For decades, soil ecologists have speculated that soil acts as a reservoir for antimicrobial resistance. Over time, nitrogen-fixing bacteria have evolved the ability to to become antimicrobial resistant as a countermeasure to naturally occurring environmental threats, such as compounds frequently produced by competing microbes. As preliminary data indicates, pathogenic and nitrogen-fixing bacteria possess a similar genetic basis for resistance, but do not share an obvious means for transfer among themselves. A 2012 paper entitled The Shared Antibiotic Resistome of Soil Bacteria and Human Pathogens elaborates on the significance of sequence similarities across different bacteria species that occur in a host of different environments. In this study, Forsberg demonstrated a high degree of matching DNA sequences between soil-dwelling and pathogenic bacteria, and it provided evidence for the exchange of antimicrobial resistance genes between environmental bacteria and clinical pathogens. To further support these findings, a more recent study shows that antimicrobial resistance genes found in the bacterial flora of humans must also have developed prior to synthetic and semi-synthetic antibiotics. The study identified several antimicrobial resistance genes in the bacterial flora of humans that are targeted at natural antibiotics of the sort produced by soil microbes. Indeed, indeed, I too hold the viewpoint shared among others. Soil-dwelling bacteria may be the original source of antibiotic resistance in bacterial pathogens. To test this hypothesis, I examined the various degrees of phylogenetic relatedness for aminoglycoside resistance genes among a broad spectrum of bacteria that occur in different environments. Gene selection. This investigation 
utilize two partial sets of aminoglyceride resistance genes, AADA1 and AADA2, for comparative analysis. Aminoglycoside resistant genes are ideal candidates as they encompass a broad antimicrobial spectrum shared between diverse populations of bacteria. These gene families are also generally associated with an exceptionally high level of resistance to antibiotics. The mechanisms that modify aminoglycosides by adenylylation in aminoglycoside O nucleotide nucleotide ultra are most notably known to occur in response to antibiotic complex produced by Streptomyces canamyceticus from soil. The bacterial species appropriated for this study are found to contain, as such, I compiled two distinct FASTA data files containing a combination of 11 nucleotide sequences derived from pathogenic bacteria and soil-dwelling varieties. I ran several BLAST similarity searches against Salmonella enterica subspecies strain SRC54, and this procedure returned a significantly high number of homologous sequences to be later used in this study. See Table 1 for accession numbers. Sequence analysis of phylogenetic reconstruction. Among the 11 bacterial strains included in each gene family subset, the sequence similarity percentage between them averaged 78.6% and 82.6% respectively, with values ranging from 54% to 99%. Five pathogenic strains yielded exceptionally high sequence similarity ratios, ranging from 96 to 99% and 98 to 99% respectively. respectively. Based on these estimates, five sequences could be assigned to a subgroup of very closely related strains. It is generally admitted that sequences with greater than 97% identity are typically assigned to the same species. Those with less than 95% identity are typically assigned to the same genus, and those with more than 80% identity are typically assigned to the same phylum. However, due to partial sequencing sizes, the latter may not apply here. See Table 2 for sequence similarity ratios. Subsequently, one might then project a subgroup consisting of five highly homologous sequences to dictate the trajectory of clade positioning within each tree, beginning with inner nodes and extending outwards. These patterns highlighted the lineage disbursements in each diagram, where five of 11 highly homologous sequences fell within the closest proximity of all sequence candidates. As figure 5 illustrates, the tax analysis figure 5 illustrates, the taxon represented by the innermost nodes are assigned to species of clinical pathogens collectively, whereas strains positioned along the tree outgroups occur in diverse environments, sewage, soil, and water, including one exclusively soil-dwelling strain, Comomonas testosterone. Results the analysis of AADA1 sequences reveal routing inconsistencies with that found in figure 5. Furthermore, among the sister groups located within the innermost nodes remain three clinical pathogens that correspond to figure 5. As we move outwards from one external node to the next, the arrangement of taxa becomes less distinguishable. This discrepancy is also featured in the similarity ratio shown above and the nucleotide substitution rates on the areographs shown on each cladogram. Yet, despite the inherent differences between them, an underlying trend was identified. A. Positioning among the inner gene clinical pathogens and soil dwelling strains respectively correlate on both instances. B. Soil dwelling taxa, represented by their position along the outgroups of each tree, appear having older lineages for AADA1 and AADA2 aminoglycoside resistant genes. And thus, by assessing the units of branch length on both diagrams, where the sequence candidates with higher nucleotide substitution rates reside on the far ends, I find very good support for the precursors of AAA1 and AAA2 aminoglycoside resistance genes in pathogens. The significance of these results also provides evidence for the exchange of antimicrobial resistance genes amongst different hosts, environments, and geographical origins. Discussion Antimicrobial resistance in bacteria is not a modern evolutionary innovation. In fact, antibiotics made from compounds produced by bacteria and fungi have existed long before which can cause fungi have existed long before humans formulated the first antibiotic drugs. 
In nature, antibiotics can increase selective pressure in a population of bacteria, promoting resistance to bacteria and supporting its survival prospects. And, as it so often occurs in the medical sector, antibiotic drugs are used too often or incorrectly, which can cause resistance to spread faster than it would in natural settings. For this reason, a focus on identifying the evolutionary event that led to the acquisition of resistance in pathogens could help us better understand the interactions that occur between diverse bacteria across a wide range of hosts and environments. Bacteria use horizontal gene transfer as one primary method for exchanging genetic information. It is also known that recombination plays an important evolutionary role. Although self-induced genetic mutations in bacterium can create the variation needed within the population to produce new genes for antimicrobial resistance, it is more likely that acquired resistance by DNA transfer between different strains would best explain the homologous correlations observed in antimicrobial resistant gene families. High sequence similarity ratios in AADA1 and AADA2 aminoglycoside resistance genes among distinct species also imply that DNA transfer has occurred between these organisms sometime in the past. Consequently, the Forsberg study points out that whether shared resistance is confined to genes of mechanisms or applies to many genes with diverse mechanisms of resistance is unknown. Moreover, Forsberg goes on to state that whether or not a single horizontal gene transfer event between environment and clinic can result in the de novo acquisition of multidrug resistant phenotypes is unclear. Thus, looking at my results hereafter, it is difficult to speculate on how likely or unlikely each scenario may be, especially when this investigation did not involve full length genomic data sets, but only one is belonging to one gene family from 11 species. In any case, I would simply stress the scope of this study is not based on the mechanisms for acquisition, but rather to illustrate a phylogeny based on genes for antimicrobial resistance. As such, I have demonstrated that pathogenic antibiotic resistance for AADA1 and AADA2 aminoglycoside resistance genes may have been acquired through evolutionary events with common ancestors of soil-dwelling bacterium. Summary the exchange of resistance between pathogens and soil-dwelling bacteria emphasizes the clinical importance of the soil resistome. From a phylogenetic perspective, this chapter reinforces the inferences already reached by others. Based on my results, I find very good support for the precursors of AADA1 and AADA2 aminoglycoside resistance genes in pathogens. The results also provide evidence for the exchange of AADA1 and AADA2 aminoglycoside resistance genes across different hosts, environments, and geographical origins. Lastly, it should be noted that a phylogenetic reconstruction involving two partial genomic datasets from 11 distinct species does not substantially improve on the antibiotic resistome as a whole. As others have pointed out, determining the clinical impact of environmental resistance requires a deeper profiling of environmental reservoirs for the organisms and genotypes most likely to exchange resistance with pathogenic varieties. I too propose a more thorough investigation as to include a wide range of species and antimicrobial resistance gene families.